，为此发挥机，切众生尽转妙法轮，教导我们。如何了生脱死，离苦得乐，速证无生。We will sangha, we agree virtue, out of compassion, for the sacred disassembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize number. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhu Dasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahato Sama Sambuddha Sang. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Allahudi Samyao Samputoshe. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Halahadi Sanyao Sambu Doshe. Yushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. Wo Jin Jian Wen De Shou Chi, Yen Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even through billions of eons. But now we see and hear it, and accept it reverently, may we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, January 30th here in southeastern Queensland, the Gold Coast. It's Saturday night, the 29th of January in California, places in the Northern Hemisphere. We're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, and welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. You'll notice we're in a different venue. Um, I hope that people will appreciate the uh, presence of our Heart Sutra scrolls here that are lovingly cal calligraphed by a bhikshuni in Taiwan, actually, who made, took a vow to do a thousand of these. And I was one of the lucky recipients of a set of four, so the Prajna Heart Sutra with beautiful... Uh, beautiful calligraphy. So, all right. Uh, now, let's see here. I'm going to move a microphone. Oh, that's too close. You can see it. You're not supposed to see behind the scenes that much. Okay. And there we are. We're balancing good sound with good visuals. All right. So, welcome indeed. Uh, we're going to do something that has become a tradition here at the, here in our series of lectures on the Flower Garland Sutra. We're going to invoke spiritual presence. We're going to ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come and join uh, this assembly and to bless everyone in attendance and to do that we have a melody and we also have a we have a accompaniment
we would like to acknowledge the country where this lecture takes place and you could say the cyberspace, the, the uh, virtual world that brings us all together. Um, actually, we can do that. We can take, um, we can make this, uh, the country that we're acknowledging can be everywhere where humanity has lived uh, through historically in a line through the present into the future. Here in southeastern Queensland, the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambe language group practice spiritual connections to land and all creation here in this location for thousands of years. And today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians. With gratitude that we share this land today, with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging. There we are. All right. That's a very elegant custom. Um, so uh, I want to be the first. I'm early. I know I'm early. I want to be the first all the same to say Happy Lunar New Year. Probably uh, not all of you will be hearing that much this year, but there are some folks for whom Lunar New Year is the moment of the calendar year. It's in Chinese, it's called Guo Nian. In uh, Vietnamese, it's called Tat. And wow, it is the, the time from which you measure the rest of the year. Uh, we're going today in our sutra lecture, <coughs> if people recall, we are in the verse section of the first stage of the Ten Stages chapter of the Avatamsaka, the Flower Garland Sutra. And the verses are magnificent today. They're talking about the quality, the character of the Bodhisattva. What's a Bodhisattva in the first stage like? And of course it talks about how happy he is. This is the stage of happiness. In Chinese it's called the Huan Shi Di. And uh, so we're going to be doing that and looking at the, the verses we've picked out today, the ones we've gone on to sequentially, we have arrived at the, uh, the stage, of, we've arrived at the part of the verses that talks about the character of the Bodhisattva. So we're going to find out about that. But then uh, we're going to move into a particular figure who is important in the the, the Avatamsaka universe, and that is the Bodhisattva Maitreya. Because every year when we come to this Lunar New Year's, to this Guonian period, we also come to the birthday of Maitreya Bodhisattva in the Buddhist calendar. And uh, there's all kinds of Dharma teachings around Maitreya. I was explaining it to a friend the other day and realized that um, I've taken for granted a lot about Maitreya Bodhisattva that other people don't know, and it's good to uh, remind us of those basics so that people have a sense of who Maitreya Bodhisattva is from the Buddhist point of view. There are other, the name Maitreya has been borrowed by numerous uh, spiritual groups um, around the world, I remember walking through the streets of Berkeley as a grad student and seeing posters on uh, telephone poles saying, Maitreya is here, come and meet him. Maitreya is here, you can meet him. The Maitreya Project. And there's an, a British gentleman who claims that he is indeed. Maitreya has already arrived, he's coming. And uh, the Buddhists would disagree. They would say, no, no, it's not, it's too soon. It's not, it's not time yet for the Maitreya that we talk about. Now, can Maitreya, Maitri means kindness. Uh, in Chinese, they translate it as Tsi Shi, Mr. Kindness, Mr. Tsi, and, uh, or the, the clan, the Tsi clan, the kindness clan. So um, that name is out there, and, but if you want to go from the, what I'm going to present is a traditional view. And interestingly, this is, it gets really, really interesting because why 
there's more than one Maitreya in the Mahayana itself. We have more than one. We have the fat Huan Shifo, the, hap, the fat laughing Buddha, probably the most recognizable Buddha image in the world is what we call Maitreya Bodhisattva. In Japan, they call him Budai, Bonza Budai. Uh, it's, it's the the hemp bag, the bag made of hemp. Looks a little bit like Santa Claus with this sack over his shoulder. You've seen that one, uh, wandering around. Very fat, very corpulent. Children like him, and uh, he's often portrayed having being covered with kids, a pile of kids on top of this huge figure of a bodhisattva. Well, that's one version. Uh, the marketplace, the commercial world, took that version and put money on him. So he is such a figure so familiar in Chinese and uh, wherever Chinese culture those households went, including Vietnam, including Korea and Japan, um, that... Uh, he becomes, he gets adopted and adapted into to things that people need. And so Maitreya becomes lucky. And money, luck means rich. So Maitreya is pictured with coins, Chinese money, cash, with the square hole in the center. Cover that. And it's like, what? That's not Buddhist? Greed? So it's a commercial adaptation, right? So that's one. That's our one bodhisattva. But there's another. There's an Avatamsaka Maitreya that I want to share with people today. Furthermore, the fat, happy Buddha has to do, there's a way of telling his story that has to do with patience, the ability to be patient. So that's another whole story. And then I have something really special for us today, which is, I mentioned uh, a couple weeks back that Master Hua had uh, given me a copy of the, the biography of Master Xuanzang, Xuanzang Fasher, the pilgrim who went at the very early years of the Tang Dynasty, who traveled to India to bring the sutras back and was successful. And then when he came back, translated all those sutras. So I mentioned uh, briefly about the story of Xuanzang meeting the robbers. And why is that something we're going to talk about later? I'm giving you previews of coming attractions for our lecture today. So why mention that? It's because throughout his entire um, life as a monk, Master Xuanzang was particularly devoted to Maitreya Bodhisattva. And in this instance, when he met the pirates on the banks of the Ganges River, he actually traveled to the Tushita heaven and saw Maitreya. So I'm going to tell that story. I've got, I found it in our, in the uh, digital copy of the biography of Master Xuanzang. So that's coming up, previews of coming attractions. Now, let me share my screen and she whiz. The cat is out of the bag, <laughs> and it's a big cat. Oh, why is there a tiger on the monk's desktop? It's because, where are we? We're in the year of the tiger in two days. It's not today. It's not tomorrow. It's Tuesday is Lunar New Year's, the first day. They call it in Chinese, Zheng Yue Chui. That's the first day of the first month, and it's the year of the tiger, and it's the water tiger. If you have to be a tiger, water tiger is a really good one to be because the water tends to tone down the um, aggressive and dominating nature of the tiger. You can see this is not a pushover. This, this look, I like his paws, his paws right there on the, the, the uh, bench that he's resting on. This particular tiger lives on the Sunshine Coast at the Australia Zoo. What a handsome character he is, right? So, all right, you're the tiger coming up. Here's our text for today. Boost it up. We're at the beginning of the verse section that reviews the contents of the prose section. 
It's, that's why they're called chong song, repetitive verses. And here we go. Sai shang ru shi xin qi de ru chu di chi yao bu ke dong pi ru da shan wang. When thoughts such as these appear, they have merged with the first stage. Their will and their devotion are as unshakable as a great king of mountains. We finished last week with the Bodhi Resolve. And when the Bodhisattva makes the Bodhi Resolve, he is reborn, he or she is reborn in the house of the Tathagata, the Rulajya, it says. Hmm, how about that? So you qualify to be a member of the Buddha's family, team, squad, household, community, uh, with that, that thought that transforms things. The Bodhi Resolve, the Putishin, known as the Bodhicitta, is so powerful that it transforms the mind and it changes your spiritual status, you could say. You can claim that you are, at rightfully so, in part of the Rulaicha, of the Tathagata's home. You're a member of the Buddhist family. And when that thought appears, you are Ru, Chu Di. You have entered, you've merged with the first stage of the Bodhisattva's knowledge. Your Zhi and your, it's called Le or Yao, the things you enjoy, we translate it as devotion, is unshakable. You're fixed on Kindness, compassion, wisdom, liberation, and generosity, because this is where you are the, the best giver. You perfect the paramita of generosity, of giving. You know how to give. You are a donor. You're a benefactor. Uh, not stingy. Not narrow. Right. So, there we go. Do xi do ai yao, yi fu do jing xin, qi da yong meng xin, qi yi qing yue xin. They feel such happiness, such delight, and pure faith as well. They feel courageous vigor to the utmost, Elation and rejoicing fill their hearts. This sounds pretty good to me. Uh, wouldn't you like to have, uh, as they say in Chinese, ji da, do you see that? Extremely big. What is it? Duo xi, much happiness. Duo ai yao, much love and bliss, you could say. Much things they enjoy. How, how do we translate it? Delight. True delight, yi fu duo jing xin. Furthermore, the delight and the happiness you think are in the heart, right? But there's duo jing xin, much pure faith, purified faith. Um, where does the faith come from? Is it in the heart? Um, interestingly, I think this is really interesting. From the Buddha's point of view, faith is part of the nature. We're born with the capacity. The hard, the, um, the what do you say? The um, program, the programming is already there in our nature, but we have to activate it. We have to get in there and um, fertilize and weed and water that capacity, that potential for faith. It's called a gun, it's called a root that uh, potential for faith in our nature is all there. But here, they have qing, that verb right there. They have purified it. They have meaning activated it. So this, uh, the bodhisattva on the first stage is not a cynic. He's not sour. His faith is there. He's willing to believe, and as a result, he is, she is, believable. 
faith that in in English faith is the same word as belief. It's also the word of the, the same word for trust. So this bodhisattva is trustworthy, and they trust because they themselves are trustworthy. You can they're worthy of you trusting them. Their approach to the world is they mostly believe. They believe. They believe not in people's words, not in their when they see somebody being waylaid by greed, they don't quit on them. They say, that's, that's a poison. Let's heal you and get to your nature because your nature is trustworthy, is able to believe, able to trust. Xin tuo, you can really trust. So they have a lot of trust. Ji da yong meng xin, what is extremely big? It's their courage. Interesting, huh? <coughs> Faith. Um, there's a cynical side of pseudoscience. That's a lot of sibilance. The cynical side of pseudoscience uh, says, uh, you're a believer. I got that a lot as uh, a monk in robes studying religion. My, uh, in, in, groups of scholars, if you join as a scholar monk, scholar nun, you have to, there's a, always a challenge. Are you, is your, uh, are you sufficiently objective? Or because you're a believer, your point of view can't be trusted because you've already made up your mind about the scientific method. You know the answer before you do your homework. Is that that's I encountered that a lot, and uh, that's a failing. Uh, that's what I say. It's pseudoscience. It's uh, cynical, because why? There have been uh, fantastic. Uh, no, that's the wrong wrong adjective. There have been ex uh, reliable, dependable avenues of scientific inquiry that begin with faith. Faith in the method, faith that the results will lead to ennobling of civilization, right? Those kinds of faiths that are not a, an obstacle to research, right? People understand the issue. Among, science, among scholars, uh, because there's this uh, notion that arose in the 20th century that somehow, well, it's probably older than that. It's, it's rooted in the conflict between the church and science. Um, and we can certainly find it. There was a, uh, at, when I was at the Graduate Theological Union, we had one of our program units was uh, a group that researched, they were, uh, they called themselves an institute for science, but all of their books were indeed, they, their fundamental preface, their fundamental uh, theorem was everything exists in the mind of God, that the mind of God, as defined by clergy from their tradition, was Nothing, no phenomenon could be discovered outside the mind of God. And that didn't, they attracted some profound research and wonderful scholars. But the problem was, at the end of the books, there was a certain smugness. Nothing that they discovered could ever push the boundaries of their faith in God being knowable and Christian. <laughs> so, okay. Now, that's, I've come around 180 degrees on my own thesis here. So, as a, a robe-wearing scholar, I found myself having to say things like, um, I trust in the nature. I trust that the mind produces 10,000 things, but 
my conscious mind can't know them. There's, if, just look at language, for example. With dual consciousness, right, wrong, day and night, male, female, yin and yang, there's always going to be more that will surprise me that I don't know and can't know. The mind's capacity, the conscious mind's capacity to know things is limited. Master Hua called it like a garbage can. You know, you, can't, you can only stuff so much garbage in it. That's the rational discriminating mind. Once you transcend duality, however, once you get the duo jing xin, the get to the stage of the bodhisattva on the first stage, then the potential of the mind and wisdom can reflect all things without discrimination. And I trust that. I believe that. So I dig into my studies and my research with many questions, lots of questions, and the encouragement to discover, to go learn, just because why? There's always going to be another living being to cross over with a unique set of confusions and attachments and poisons and ignorance. So the Bodhisattva never, it's eternal learning in the, the best tradition of scholarship. So at that point, people say, ah, now you're a believer. You're just a believer. We can't trust a word you say because we know that you've already made your mind up. So, okay, so that's a challenge. Here the Bodhisattva has duo jing xin, and the more they trust, the more they can have ji da yong meng xin, real courage, tremendous courage as they pursue their studies because why they're not afraid of what they will discover. They know their own mind and living beings come from that same place. Compassion is their source and wisdom is the expression of it. And they can be sad, they can be discouraged, but they don't quit. Uh, Furthermore, what else? Elation and rejoicing fill their hearts. This is the constant state of a first stage bodhisattva. How about that? They're not sad sacks. They're not cynics. They're not misanthropes, people who've given up on the world. Sounds good to me. And where's the source? Where does it come from? How do they get there? They give a lot. They do a lot of giving. And as they say, we say that probably every lecture. Helping others is the source of happiness. It's an endless source of happiness. The more we give, the happier we get. So you want to be happy? Give more. Here we go. One more. One more. Ready? Yuan Li Yu Dou Zheng Nao Hai Ji Chen Hui Chan Jing Ar Zhi Zhi Shan Shou Hu Zhu Gan They leave contention and conflict behind. They are free from harming, troubling, or hatred, able to know shame, to feel respect, to be righteous, they are good at guarding their sense faculties. All right. This is great. It ties in directly to Maitreya Bodhisattva, where we're going to go in just a bit. They leave contention and conflict behind. Yan Li Yu Do Zheng. So, right? They don't go near contention and conflict, um, which is tough, which is hard in a world like ours that they call This is the Dharma ending age, the time of the Dharma's demise. And the character of the Dharma's demise is lots of contention. You think how hard it is to stick together. Just uh, one example. When I was a fan of baseball, 
I was a preteen. I was from like nine to like 14. I was a baseball player. I was a pitcher. And I had three speeds, slow, slower, and slower yet. Uh, but I was a successful baseball pitcher. And the teams that I admired were my local teams, the Cleveland Indians and the Detroit Tigers, mostly the Tigers. I was a Tigers fan. And back then, this was now, you know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, half a century ago, players in, on teams stayed with the teams. Unless, unless the, the front office decided to trade them for some reason. But Mickey Mantle, the New York Yankees, didn't play as a journeyman with... Uh, I, I strayed from my Tigers. and Let me stick with the Tigers here. So players stayed with their clubs. And they were associated with the, the towns, the cities that they played for. And that was a big deal. You know, you, your hometown team, you expected to, to be able to cheer for your favorites for 10 years and more. There was a moment when uh, it was a crisis for my, uh, my young preteen fan's heart. My favorite players on the Tigers were Harvey Keene. And... For the Indians, it was Rocky Colavito. Hit four home runs in one game. I woke up one morning, and they had been traded. They'd been traded. And my favorite players are now on opposite teams. And I remember how I didn't know who to, who to, who to cheer for anymore uh, on the Tigers. And, oh my, that was a crisis. So this, now, okay, so that's the point. Back in the day, players stayed with clubs, stayed with teams, and you could cheer for them for years and, and got to know them, and it was an identity. It was a way of something that was a constant in the world. Every spring, here were your favorites. Al Kaline, playing for the Detroit Tigers, right? Al Kaline and... Harvey Keene. So now we're in a different time when there's this thing called free agency and players will willingly leave a club to go play for someone else for more money. And players are rarely at a franchise long enough for them to get any, for you to know them, care about them. Now, I'm delighted to say that my hometown basketball team, the Golden State Warriors, uh, have players who've been around for long enough for us to get to know them. That's another story. But that's an example of the Dou Zheng Jian Gu Shidai. We're now in a time when staying married, it's very hard to stay married. Staying with a company, uh, with the rise of Silicon Valley, what were they saying? The average employee will work like 18 months in a company is already a lot. Uh, most employees carry their resume with them because they expect to be shopped around. Um, band, music bands break up. Rolling Stones are an exception, hallelujah. Um, it's a difficult time now to stay together. And that has to do with our, our Dharma ending age. The Buddha predicted it, and it's going to get worse. Um, this is a difficult time for people to be together without contention and conflict. Furthermore, these bodhisattvas, what? Now, hi, Chi Chen Hui. Troubling. They don't, these bodhisattvas don't think to trouble folks. That's not their purpose, to get others upset or afflicted. They're free from it. Yuan Bi, they're far away from Nao Hai, troubling others. 
scolding, just being happy when things are in chaos. They are not agents of chaos. Right? Furthermore, what else? Look at their qualities. Chan Jing are zhi zhi. They are able to know shame. They know they are they know the things they've done wrong. They're clear about them and they don't want to do them again. They want to be free from mistakes. And they respect others fundamentally, including not just people. They respect other beings. Their joy at being alive. They are righteous. And this last line is really good. Look. Shan shou hu zhu gan. When they are, when the time they get up, walk around in the morning, till the end of the day, when they go back and rest, their eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind are well regulated. They're not going out seeking. Uh, I have a story about that. Um, for 25 years of my life as a monk, I didn't touch money. The, there's a, a precept that shramaneras and shramanerikas, before you become a bhikshu or a bhikshuni, you take a precept to not touch gold, silver, or valuable objects. Yin Qian Jie, it's called. And further, I didn't, so I did, I did not touch money. I didn't have a bank account, didn't have a credit card, didn't have a debit card, didn't have a penny to my name. And the result of that was that my mind didn't go into stores. Uh, this is long before the time of online shopping. But I didn't, I spent zero time of my conscious day thinking about getting things and prices and bargains and gift stamps and bank accounts and debts. And it was just because that the yin qian jie, I didn't realize until uh, I became manager of a monastery um, 25 years after leaving home and had to put my mind once again on money. It didn't occur to me, I didn't, I'm going to put this down here while I tell my story. Here we go. It didn't occur to me how much. Um, business you have to engage in if you are in the marketplace. Um, being wealthy is a kind of prison because you're surrounded by people who count your money and people who take, who invest your money, who take care of it. And you are constantly, if you're in the marketplace, you're constantly looking for bargains. You're constantly looking for the lowest price. And what a burden it is to have to take care of the wealth you have. And when I was holding that yin qian jie, um, the precept against having gold, silver, or valuable objects uh, at all, having no truck with them, was a freedom First of all, to be grateful with the things that I had, with the essentials that kept me alive, and um, not having to think about the entire world of money, finance, and possessions. It was a kind of liberation. Now, I have to say, the, there's an asterisk. You go down to the footnote. Somebody was paying the bills. Uh, Somebody was buying food and cooking it and making offerings to the Sangha. So before, you know, I can't, I have to say that I was able to not hold money and not 
engage in commerce because there were people who supported me who were willing to do that. So it doesn't do to say, ha ha ha, I'm pure, I don't touch money. Well, then you don't eat either, right? And you, you can live without heat or clothes, right? No, or gasoline for the car, no. Somebody was supporting the Sangha who were willing to not have money. And so the point, the takeoff point for this story was to say, talking about uh, guarding your sense faculties, um, not wanting, not thinking about stores. I could bow past, uh, for example, uh, Wilshire Boulevard. People in L.A., Southern California, know about Wilshire Boulevard. It's called the Golden Mile, right? Uh, Beverly Hills, UCLA, uh, sidewalks that have glittery gold in them. Um, took 30 days to get from South Pasadena to Santa Monica, and we went from zero Wilshire Boulevard all the way to Santa Monica on Wilshire Boulevard, bowing. And I cannot tell you a single store that was there because my mind, I knew I wasn't, I couldn't buy anything. For me to step into a store was a waste of time and I couldn't, I couldn't do any commerce, I couldn't buy anything, so why do it? My mind didn't go into the store. I wasn't thinking, oh, look at that, oh, 31 flavors, mm, Baskin and Robbins, mm, I wonder what the new flavor is. It wasn't, it was a waste to me, for me. So how, uh, I remember what was the first, among the first things that I had to think about buying was uh, car, uh, tire, car tires. I had a, a vehicle to drive me to my doctoral program and uh, my car needed tires. And I had to think about, you know, Wow, let's see, B.F. Goodrich, maybe Goodyear, maybe Bridgestone, maybe, mm, you know, maybe get some European tires, Michelin. You know, it's like, oh, no, suddenly, boom, 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 boom. And the faculty that I was not guarding was my mind. I was thinking about, oh, quality versus mm, economy. You get as good as you can afford, pay a little more, you get a little better. False economy, buy cheap and have to buy it again when they go bad. Ugh, there you go. So here it is. What do they say? The bodhisattva is good at guarding his or her sense faculties. They don't let their minds constantly discuss, discriminate, all the different kinds of qualities of goods that they might buy. Oh my. Um, how, you know, the other thing that if you're not in the marketplace, you are free from advertisements. Whew. My first awareness of how much advertising, advertising I had absorbed happened during a session at Antaiji in Kyoto. Uh, sitting down and looking at the wall. In, in the Soto school, you face the wall when you meditate, not face inward. And watching the sun send my shadow slowly across the wall for eight hours a day, sitting there, and watching my mind um, sing all the commercials that I had absorbed on TV. And this is, well, I got to Antaiji when I was 19, and I had watched television since I was about six. I was the first generation of television watchers. And the beer commercials, <laughs> smoother, fresher, less filling, that's clear. Blatz is Milwaukee's finest beer. Why do I know four or five beer commercials? Because I watch baseball. And the beer companies were selling or advertising on the, the TV. <laughs> so I learned them. I learned to sing all those commercials, and I learned about toothpaste, and I learned about see the USA in your Chevrolet, 
America is asking you to call. So, all right, well, I didn't need to know that. I didn't need to sing it. There I was meditating with my legs crossed in Kyoto, Japan, singing beer and automobile car tire ditties, advertising ditties that just poured out of my mind. It was my inner tape recorder playing back everything that I had absorbed because, why? Watching TV, I was not guarding my sense faculty. And the truth of this that you meditators will appreciate is that our six senses are like fly paper. We don't have fly paper anymore. That's not a good analogy. Our six senses are like photographic film. We don't have photographic film anymore. Nobody uses film cameras. Okay, some people do. What do we like? Our six senses, what's the stickiest thing we have? Our six senses are like honey. Anything that touches it sticks to it. Honey is sticky. You ever honey drip off the edge of the jar or the spoon? Sticky. It's really sticky. And our six senses catch everything that we put in front of them. What we put in front of our eyes is still there. Put in front of our ears, still there. Nose, tongue, body, most of all, the mind. Oh boy, still there. And by sitting still, and they say, Yang Guan Bi, Yang Guan Bi, Bi Guan Ko, Ko Guan Xin, the eyes contemplate the nose, nose contemplates the mouth, the mouth contemplates the mind by reciting. You Du She Liu Gun, you bring back your six senses, you're meditating there. And disengage them from that constant inward uh, uh, gathering of stuff. And what happens, all the stuff that's on your inner tape banks plays back. Brush up, brush up, brush up, get the new ipana with the brand new flavor. It's dandy for your teeth. Bucky Beaver singing to me about ipana toothpaste while I'm meditating. They are good at guarding their sense faculties. Yeah. All right. So, by golly, we are now going to shift. We're going to shift over to Happy New Year, Year of the Tiger. And let me begin by showing you. Hmm. Let's see now. Here is... Maitreya, mostly we know this guy. He's known as the peace guy, isn't he? You recognize him? He is by far the most acknowledged Buddha. He's, there are, anybody who's been to Asia, been to Hong Kong, been to Chinatown, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Dallas, right? They see these Buddhas in the restaurants, in the shop windows, and they people think, that's the Buddha. There's the Buddha. Look at, he's got beads, he's got a huge belly, he's got this gold ingot from China in his hand, money. So that's a typical popularized Maitreya Bodhisattva. Not Buddha, Maitreya Bodhisattva. Here's a Religious one. He's got a hemp bag like Santa Claus. He's got recitation beads. He's got that familiar big belly and a big smile. Big smile. Okay. Is that, quote, the real Maitreya? Ah, uh, well, let's see. Here's another. You might call this one a corrupted Maitreya. Big belly, he's got beads around his neck, but look, he's leaning on a pile of cash. Uh, is that what people want? So Maitreya, who's this, we're not sure who he is. Why is he like this? He's fat, that's what we know. He's smiling, we know that much. What else? Another one, look at this one. Oh, this Maitreya is 
Cover to the children. Does he guarantee fertility to parents who want kids? Is that? Hmm. Funny. All right. Well, I got a stranger one. There's a very strange one. Look at this one. This Maitreya is aiming for world domination. <laughs> He's got a covering over his navel. You're not supposed to see his navel. He's got a recitation, but he's got the globe in his hands. Ah, 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 ah. Does he look like anybody you know? Yeah. Global domination. We don't usually associate that with bodhisattvas. Mm. All right. So what about that? Let's look into that one. That, in fact, the first thing that we want to point out is, indeed, there is an image of Maitreya, that he is fat, overweight, smiling, money, kids, blah, blah. What's that all about? That's not the real Maitreya. However, the, the, what, that's what you call an iconographic representation. That's the artist's view of what Maitreya must look like. Sudhana, our pilgrim, as a little baby, another mistaken view of a bodhisattva. Okay. Why is Maitreya fat? What is he, what's the point of that? Shifu, we turn to Master Hua. Shifu says, we want to emulate the spirit of Maitreya who kai ko bian xiao, xiao tian xia, ke xiao zhi ren, du da nang rong, rong shi jie nan rong zhi shi. His open mouth is perpetually laughing at all the funny people in the world. His huge belly can hold all the unendurable events everywhere. The things that are hard to bear. Okay. Unendurable events, probably things that are hard to bear is a better way to say. This is one aspect of a bodhisattva. Master Hua says, learn the skill of patience from Maitreya. Isn't it wonderful? He's always laughing. He's got a pot belly. What do they say? They say, xin guang ti pang. You gain weight when your mind is broad. He's got no afflictions. Somebody says he's known as invincible because ajita, because he eats more than anybody else. How could his stomach get so big? That's why he's invincible. Somebody says, oh, he's got great strength. He can topple a mountain with one hand. Sherpa says, you're all wrong. How is Maitreya called invincible, ajita, wunang sheng. It's because he cultivates patience. He has cultivated the dharma door of patience paramita. Now, why are we, we left the avatamsaka? No, we didn't. We're coming up to New Year's. Lunar New Year's happens Tuesday. Sheng Yue Chui, first day of the first month. Lunar calendar. You're the tiger. Maitreya Bodhisattva's birthday. He appears in the Avatamsaka Sutra. But we've got a... And then I went, oop, however, look at the fat, happy Bodhisattva. Who's that? Is that him? Sort of. There is stories behind how he got to be so big. He's got this bu dai. He's got a cloth bag over his shoulder, and he goes out asking for alms. What kind of alms? Afflictions. He says, you got troubles? Give them to me. He hopes people in the world will have no afflictions, will end suffering, will gain happiness. So that's how he became the bu dai he sheng. He carries the cloth bag so that you can give your afflictions to him and it won't bother him. You'll be free of them. 
He will take them from you. No problems. No worries. And here is where the old fool comes from. Lao zhuo chuan na ao, dan fan pu zhong bao. Bu zhe bu po, bu po, bu zhe han. Wan shi sui yuan liao. Yu ren ma lao zhuo, lao zhuo zhi shuo hao. Yu ren da lao zhuo, lao zhuo zi shui dao. Ti chui zai mian shang sui ta zi gan liao. Wo ye sheng li qi, ni ye wu fan nao. Jie yang bo lo mi bian shi miao zhong bao. 若知这消息，何愁到不了 ？That's the Chinese, and it goes like this: The old fool, what is he like? He wears tattered clothes. He fills his belly with tasteless food, patches his robe to keep out the cold, and as things come, so they go. His belly's big, why? So he can hold praise so hot, and blame so cold. Splits his face and his smile so full. At situations he finds laughable, the jewel of patience—it's a pearl so rare. Okay, so far so good. Everybody following? This is the the real story behind the fat, laughing, happy Bodhisattva called Maitreya. It's this interesting story because we're saying there's another one, but let's return to the story. Somebody scolds the old fool; he simply agrees. Somebody hits him; he smiles, falls down on his knees. You spit in his face; he lets it dry. He's not upset. You save your energy. The jewel of patience—it's a pearl so rare. So now we see. Oh, that's why he doesn't respond because he wants your afflictions. And once you scold him. Hit him, spit on him. He doesn't react. Fire goes out. War has been averted. Okay, his belly's big because he can hold praise so hot and blame so cold. Splits his face and a smile so full at the situations he finds laughable. The jewel of patience, Ren Ru Po Lo Mi, the paramita of patience. It's a pearl so rare. And the song ends. It goes. Now you've heard of this patience, Kung Fu. Maitreya wants to share it with you. If you set this aside and go seeking some other Tao, I got to ask you, who's the old fool anyhow? <laughs> All right, that's interesting. Now you know what's even more interesting. Let's look at the other Maitreya. Here he is, the real Maitreya Bodhisattva, according to the Avatamsaka Sutra. Here's a background. Who is this? This is the stupa at Borobudur. Okay, we're gonna stop sharing and then share again. Here we go. All right, there we are. This is the stupa at. Borobudur, in Indonesia. Here is Maitreya Bodhisattva, right here. Does he look like the fat Buddha? He doesn't. He looks like other bodhisattvas. Sudana, the pilgrim, is down here, and the, sadly the stones are have been removed. But here is the assembly gathered around Maitreya Bodhisattva. And this is an ancient vision that folks had of what the real Maitreya Bodhisattva looked like. And then we go to India and look at this. Here's Maitreya Bodhisattva. Doesn't look like the fat Buddha to me. Hmm. One thing he's got a mustache. Clearly, it's a guy. He looks Western. He looks like he might come from Afghanistan, or from Persia, or from maybe from India or Pakistan. The trade routes. 
right? He looks like an Aryan, standing tall, wearing his sandals, wearing his robes, very peaceful, nice looking guy. Maitreya Bodhisattva, not the happy Buddha covered in money and children. Here he is again. Now, these are images from Gandharan tradition in India. India that had contact with the West, with the Hellenistic civilizations of Greece, Persia, Rome, Mediterranean civilizations. Again, right? Yeah. That's another Maitreya. And which Maitreya is that? That's the Maitreya of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Here's another version of him without the mustache, but that same look of inner peace, same look of wisdom, and as they say, kindness. He's kind. Zishu, my tree, kindness. All right. Uh, the Japanese had a similar sense. Here's a Japanese Maitreya. Notice that he's not fat. He's very slim, in fact. Okay, what's going on? Why, why do we have these two kinds of Maitreyas? Well, both are, in fact, iconographic images. It's a, an artist's rendition of what Maitreya must look like, right? Okay. Where did the thinking come that created these images? Came from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Avatamsaka Sutra. What was he like in the Avatamsaka Sutra? Well, okay, let me look at you for a minute. So, <coughs> people know about Sudana. His name is Shantai, Shantai Tongzi. He is a pilgrim. And his story appears in chapter 39 of the Flower Garland Sutra, which is indeed the longest. It's a quarter of the entire sutra. It has to do with the pilgrimage of Sudhana. And in the pilgrimage, he goes to visit uh, 53, 52 or 53, depending on how you count, because there's two in one visit, uh, teachers, Shan Jirsha, Kalyana Mitra. And number 50 is Maitreya Bodhisattva. And in fact, Maitreya Bodhisattva is the one who ushers Sudhana into Buddhahood. Uh, he greets him, they sing trade songs and poems back and forth. Maitreya praises him, Sudhana says, I've been looking for you forever, praises him. And then Maitreya says, okay, you've done it. You've asked your question about the Bodhi Resolve 50 to 50, 49 times. You've learned from 49 teachers. I'm going to let you enter Virochana's jeweled precious pagoda. And he goes, snap. It's not a very good. There we go. Better snap. Snaps his fingers. The doors open. Sudhana goes in and has experiences the 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 uh fa jie, fa jie jing jie, the fa jie guan, the Dharma realm experience of interpenetration without obstruction. And Maitreya, so he goes, wow, this is amazing. Where did this come from? How is this possible? He says, Sudhana, to Maitreya, Da Sheng, big sage, great sage, how did you first fa putishin? How did you make the Bodhi resolve the first time? And in other words, when did you, back in your past, set your foot, set feet, set foot on the Bodhisattva path. So Maitreya says, oh, okay, I'll tell you. He says, here's my story. He says, Shananzi, Ruan yu wo cong he chu lai. You ask where I'm from? Shananzi, wo cong sheng chu mo luo ti guo. 
而来于此。善男子，彼有聚落，名为放舍；有张者子，名居破罗。为化其人，令入佛法而住于彼；又为生处一切人民，随所应化而为说法，而为父母及诸眷属。婆罗门等演说大圣，令其屈辱，故住于彼而从彼来。He says, he says, good man, you want to know where I came from and where my body resolve came from? Good man, I came here from Magadha in India, southern India, where I was born. Good man, in a village named Dwelling, there lives the son of an elder named Gopalaka. There lived in my past lives, who sought to transform his community. So that they could master the Buddha Dharma, he spoke Dharma for all the people in his hometown, each according to their potentials, differently for every individual. He explained the Mahayana Dharma for his mother, his father, his family, for the neighboring religious authorities, the Brahmins, and others, so that they would develop an interest in it. That's why I lived there and why I came from that place. This is different. Look at that. The motive for Maitreya Bodhisattva to cultivate the way was filiality. Was from a connection to his parents, to his family, to his neighbors who weren't Buddhist, so that they would hear the Dharma and get interested in it and cultivate themselves. He sought to transform his community so they would master the Buddha Dharma. Look at that. That's interesting. He wanted to be a preacher. He wanted to be a community organizer from the place of spirituality. He wanted to bring people together at the level of principle. So that they would, as our sutra said today, not fight. So that they would all be happy like him. Give me your afflictions, he said. But notice, he spoke dharma for the people in his town. Not all the same. You're not going to get everybody to agree. Some people think <laughs> doctors. And science are unreliable, so others see doctors and scientists creating life-saving medicines and say thank you. So different, huh? So, but he has to speak dharma for all of them. He has to find a way to communicate with them all. So I think that is fascinating. That. Maitreya Bodhisattva in the Avatamsaka Sutra explains his motive for cultivating Buddhism is filiality, a sense of connection, and wanting to repay his parents, his family, even his neighbors, people in his community. How about that? Isn't that cool? That's from the Ru Fa Jie Pin, entering the Dharma Realm, Chapter Thirty Nine. Indeed, indeed, I like that. Okay, now I promised something. Mind you, you know what we're about. Why are we doing this? Because we're just about to get to Guanyin, to Chinese New Year's. We're two days away, and Chinese New Year's every year is also Maitreya Bodhisattva's birthday. So. I thought to open a little bit of a door into Maitreya Bodhisattva. Where is Maitreya Bodhisattva? And if he's that handsome, tall, strapping Bodhisattva, where does Maitreya Buddha come from? Is if he's the fat, happy Maitreya Bodhisattva, where does Maitreya Buddha come from? How does he get from that happy, corpulent, rich guy with a bag, full of children,、uh, who is in fact None of the above, but says, "Give me your afflictions; I'll take them from you." 
uh, I can sing the blues really well, make you feel better. Right. How do you get to Buddhahood from that? Okay. Story. Story goes, there have been Buddhas in the past. Our Buddha was Shakyamuni, Shirjamuni Fo. He was alive, breathing, walking around 2,500 years ago, historical record of him. We are now in the 2,500 years removed from him, but there will be another Buddha coming along. Our world may not be here exactly. Our, we will reincarnate into the, next, the world where the time has come, the next Buddha appears. His name will be, ah, Maitreya. Milofo, that's where the Buddha will come from. He's not the Buddha yet. Where is he? The teaching in the Mahayana tradition is that, I actually don't know if the Theravada teaches this the same, but the teaching says that Buddhas, before they become Buddhas, before the time is ready for them to appear in the world and be born to Lady Maya and come out and leave home and cultivate, etc. Before that, they stay in one of the heavens. They live there waiting for the time on the world where they will be a Buddha, waiting for that time to be right. And they live in a place called the Tushita heaven. But the story goes on and says the Tushita heaven has an outer court and an inner court. They're in the inner court speaking Dharma and the devas come around to listen and if you you know if you have the ability you go listen uh, so that's the story and then the time comes and they are they are dang lai xiao sheng. they are born down into the realm of humans and another Buddha has arrived so we want to be there when that happens in whatever body we're in in that world it's for Maitreya it's called a long hua fa hui the Longhua Hui Shang, the Dragon Flower Assembly, and it's only three days long. So Maitreya, as he becomes the Buddha, will be there for three days and three nights teaching. That's it. Some Buddha's lifespans are much, 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 much longer. Shakyamuni uh, lived to be, was it, how many, 70, 60? He taught Dharma for 49 years. So, and then his time was up. That's considered short, but Maitreya is remarkably short, three days. Okay, now, what about this? Okay, we have a story. Here's the book. It is, we're going to come back. I'll tell you what we're going to look at. This is, we're going to come back to, see here, page 76, but it's, is that, did we, 81, okay, 76. We're going, to come, we're going to look at the title of it. It's called, there we are, title page is Biography of Tripitaka Master of the Great Tsun Monastery of the Great Tang Dynasty. This is the biography of Master Shen Zhuang, Shen Zhang, with a preface by his disciple Hui Li, and edited by Li Rongxi in volume 50, number 2053 of the Taisho, the Da Zhang Jing, you can find it. The Da Ci An Si is in Xi'an. It used to be in Chang'an. The early years of the Tang Dynasty, monastery Ci An Si is there. Okay, and that's the, you know, in, in the Buddhist tradition, you call a monk by where he is from. So Master Yongjia is the master from Yongjia. Master Da Ci'an Fasher is, or the Ci'an Fasher is from the monk from Ci'an. Okay, we're going back. We're going back, back to page 91. What story do we have to tell? Story about someone who all his life admired Maitreya Bodhisattva. And Maitreya Bodhisattva 
taught a particular text called the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, the commentary on the Yogacara stages of yoga, the yoga vehicle. It's a meditation text, and Master Shenzhuang wanted to get that in particular and bring it back to the West, to China, bring it back to the East. And uh, so... Hold on. It was page 76. You got to go back to page 76. There we are. Okay. Now, for our kind hearted volunteer who is translating, I'm just going to read. If you can read along with me, then that should work. Let's see here. You can translate along with me. There we go. So, what is going on? Master Shenzong has already made it to India. He is on, he's with a group of pilgrims who are traveling with him. He's going from monastery to monastery, studying with teachers and seeing the sacred sites where the Buddha lived. You know, this is the seventh century. So it was at that point, 1200 years earlier. Uh, 715, yeah, 1100 years earlier. Okay. So, after having paid homage to the sacred sites in the country of Ayodhya, the master sailed down the Ganges River, east, with more than 80 people in the same boat. So he's in a big boat, intending to go to Hayamuka, this country. They went for a hundred Chinese li. They came to a place in the river that was dense, where there was Ashoka trees on both sides of the river. So the trees were growing down over the river. And from the woods on each side of the river, more than 10 boatloads of pirates suddenly emerged at the same time and rowed against the current towards them. The 80 people in Master Shendong's boats were terrified. Several of them jumped into the river to escape the pirates. The pirates quickly took charge of the boat, sent it back to the bank, and told everybody, get off the boat take off your clothes. Now, Indian pirates who are fearlessly robbing ships on the river, you know they're scary guys. These are heavy-duty Indian pirates. They have swords in their teeth. They are fearsome. So, the pirates compelled the boat to sail to the bank, ordered the people to take off their clothes so they could look for jewels and gems hidden in their bodies and their clothes. They worshipped a god called the Durga. And every year, the pirates would find one handsome man of good quality in the autumn season to be killed and sacrificed to the deity so they could get happiness and blessedness. <laughs> we will kill you and shed your blood so we will be happy and because our god likes it. That's the Durga. Upon seeing, they looked at all 80 people and they thought, oh, here's a good one. He's grand and handsome in appearance. He looks really strong. They said, we got a good one. This season, the sacrifice to the deity, it, we haven't found anybody yet, but this monk looks really good. He's got a nice refined appearance. How lucky that we get to kill him in sacrifice. Master Shenzhuang did not scream, did not fight. He said instead, I wouldn't want to take my ugly, filthy body as a sacrifice to your god. However, I'm, I'm not worthy, he said, <laughs> but I've come from a far distance with the intention of worshiping the Bodhi tree and the Buddha's image on Vulture Peak, as well as seeing scriptures of the Dharma. And if you kill me here without my intentions being fulfilled, you know what? It's going to be bad luck for you. So I'm concerned about your well-being. Probably better not to kill me. Okay. <laughs> you see what an unusual man he is. All the people in the boat begged for mercy on behalf of Master Shendron. They said, take me, take me, don't touch the monk. The pirates could not be moved from their plan. The ringleader set his men to get water and clear the ground in the wood. Found a wood full of flowering trees. Make an altar, put clay around it. He ordered two men with their swords unsheathed to lead the master to the altar, and they were going to chop him up right there. Master Shendrong showed no expression of fear 
And the pirates were, first of all, amazed. He was like, sure, all right. With a feeling that he would not be spared, he said to the pirates, okay, give me a little time. Don't press me too hard because I want to die happily with an easy mind. That's better for you that way. So, check. The master concentrated his mind on the Tushita Palace and meditated on Maitreya Bodhisattva. With the desire to be born in that place, pay homage and make offerings to the Bodhisattva and to hear the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra from him. Okay, he's about to be killed. What does he want? He says, okay, I'm going to go to see uh, Mila Pusa up in the Tushi to heaven. That's fine. That's good. I want to hear the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. After hearing the wonderful Dharma and achieving supernatural powers and wisdom, he'd be reborn down in the world again to teach these people and make them practice better deeds. So his thought is, okay, the sooner I die, the sooner I can go to see Maitreya Bodhisattva, the sooner I can come back to teach these people. What a mind. He would also widely propagate the Dharma, all the Dharmas, for the benefit and happiness of all beings. So he bowed to the Buddhas of the Ten Quarters, sat in meditation, concentrating his mind on Maitreya Bodhisattva without any distracting thoughts. So he started to meditate. Right there, sitting on the altar where he's gonna, his blood is going to flow. While he was in contemplation, it seemed in his mind that he ascended Mount Sumeru, first, second, and third heavens, he saw Maitreya Bodhisattva at the wonderful precious terrace, Miao Bao Tai, at the Dou Shuai Tuo Tian Nei Gong, surrounded by a multitude of devas. At that moment, Master Shindrong was so overjoyed, physically and mentally, he became unaware that he was on the sacrificial altar and he forgot all about the pirates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something's going on here. All his fellow travelers wailed and wept aloud because they didn't want to see their Shurfu killed. But in a moment, a gale, a black wind, rose from the four quarters, breaking down the trees and blowing sand in the air. Waves rose in the river and the boats were overturned. The pirates were greatly frightened. And they said, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Where does this Shramana come from? What's his name? They replied, you idiots. It's so much, so many words. He's the monk from China seeking the Dharma. If you gentlemen kill him, you will be committing a deadly sin. In view of the windstorm, we know the deities are now upset. You've made the gods angry. You had better repent now. It befits you to make a quick repentance, they said. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet they did. The pirates were fearful and begged for pardon with remorse one after the other. They prostrated before the master to take refuge under him, but he paid them no mind. He was, he was meditating. When the pirates touched him with their hands, he opened his eyes and said, Oh, uh, time? You ready? Okay. The pirate said, We dare not harm the teacher. Please accept our repentance. Right? So what happened? A storm blew up black clouds and sand, trees blowing down. And they thought, maybe this is not such a good idea, they thought. So they tapped him as we're, they're bowing to him. They said, uh, uh, we're not going to kill you. Would you please take us as your disciple? The master accepted their worship and apology and told them such evil deeds as killing, stealing, bowing to xieshi, wrong deities, will cause you to suffer pains in the hells in the future. Why should you sow the seeds of suffering for an unlimited long time just for the sake of this body which lasts for such a short time? Like lightning, like morning dew, he says. What's he doing? Speaking Dharma for the pirates. The pirates bowed and apologized, saying, our thoughts were erroneous and upside down. We did what we should not do and served the deity whom we should not serve, the Durga. If we did not meet you, Sherful, with blessedness and virtue, moving the mysterious gods, how could we have heard such inspiring instruction? From today on, we will stop practicing this career. May our teacher be our witness. They said. Then <laughs> they admonished one another, collected their weapons, and threw them in the river. They threw their swords in the river. They returned the clothes and money they'd stolen in pillage from the owners. They got the five precepts 
the windstorm stopped. Being delighted, the pirates worshipped the master and went away. The fellow travelers praised the master, amazed in an unusual manner. All the people far and wide who heard about it remarked, this was extraordinary. If it were not for his sincerity in speaking the Dharma, how could this miraculous incident have ever happened? Okay, there we go. Maitreya Bodhisattva is in the Tushita heavens in inner courtyard, inner court, waiting for the time to come. Master Shrendrong, who lived just 1,300 years ago, 1,400 years now, could see him and was so inspired by him that he was just thrilled. Finally, he got to meet his, his spiritual mentor. Uh, and ordinary folks like the pirates they gave up what was wrong in return for what was right and proper. So, happy birthday, Maitreya Bodhisattva, coming up. If you want to bow to the, the fat, happy Buddha, and you see him every day at the monastery, every time you go in the dining hall, every monastery in the Mahayana tradition has a Maitreya in the in dining hall. And you can practice being patient. He opens his mouth and laughs at all the humorous people in the world. His belly is big because he can hold praise so hot and blame so cold. All the unbearable things in the world he can bear. He takes away our afflictions. He asks us for them, puts them in his bag. Or you can worship the Avatamsaka Bodhisattva who was filial to his parents, to his family, to his neighbors and taught them the Dharma so that they could leave suffering and get happy. All right. There we go. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Um, I would like to ask the monks at Berkeley Monastery to tell us about what is going on uh, this, with the new schedule. Are you there, Jin Chuan? Uh, it's actually Jin Wei. Hi, Jin Wei, sure. Hi. Okay. Yeah, we're in in the forest, Redwood Vihara, uh, Redwood Forest, and yeah, we have a, a, a quite few announcements. So some events are connected to celebration of uh, Lunar New Year. So uh, this coming uh, Tuesday, February first, will uh, at nine a.m. California time to ten a.m. We recite the Om Mani Padme Hum mantra and. Your master, show the screen. Okay. Well, the master, can you show the screen? Uh, uh, maybe. I can't see it yet. Sorry. Hold on. Wait one moment. Okay. Ah, got to share my screen. There we go. Right there. Good. Oh, yeah. Go. So from 9 to 10 a.m., we recite Om Mani Padme Hu Mantra, and our beloved uh, monk, Jean Fosher, will give uh, words of encouragement for the new year. <laughs> So definitely it's worthy to, to attend. And also we have a three days of Amitabha session start this coming Saturday, next Saturday, February 5th. In the morning will be transmission of eight precepts. And for three days, we recite the Amitabha, Buddha's Amitabha's name. So this is another kind of uh, new year activity in the monastery. And oh yes, the important is the fact that those who will, will attend the session can also offer the uh, dedication merit plaques, uh, pieways. Yeah, you can fill up the form. You can offer two of them, long life or for uh, rebirth, depends what you how, how you wish. So this is the uh, opportunity to not just cultivate for yourselves and also support the people who you care about. And uh, we have some events related to Dharma Ram Buddhist University. 
you can uh, a second go down. Yes, you can see Professor Doug Powers will talk about freedom, Buddhism, and the Matrix. <laughs> And this is response to the new premiere of the movie. Uh, the, I think this is part number four, the the new uh, Matrix uh, resurrect, Resurrection, if I could remember. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn what is the real, Doug Powers, Professor Doug Powers will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, or maybe everything is illusion. If you're interested, you can uh, register. You, there must be see right register here, and you can join. It will be a Zoom call with the professor Doug Powers. Uh, also, the February eighth, uh, this Tuesday, from seven thirty p.m. opportunity to meet the dean of academics, Professor Marty Verhoeven, and Professor Stacy Chan. We talk about the Dharma Rambunis University, present the programs, uh, talk, answer all the questions anyone has about the, um, about the university and maybe one of the New Year resolution could be to join the, the program. It is coming uh, fall semester, 2022. Also- that is a, the, That's a Zoom call, right, also? Right, this is Zoom call. This is virtual open house for yeah, the DRB. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll, I'll advertise. Want people to know about that? Yeah. Good. Right, and also uh, our the winter break is almost done. Some classes return, like uh, Stephen Tanner on Wednesday offer uh, his class about the Buddhist meditation basics at seven thirty p.m. It's also Zoom class. You can find the link over there. And if I'm not mistake, Professor Marty Verhoeven will start again teaching about Avatamsaka Sutra on Fridays, begin on February 11. But it's, it's not announced yet here. Yes, it's there. Is there? Oh, it's here. OK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, class resumes on February 11. Same format, 7.30, 8.50 meditation. And 8.15 to 9 will be a lecture. So this is all oh, right. It's with one more event tomorrow in the morning, 6:30 a.m. will be our monthly recitation and dedication of merit for you know Guan, great compassion mantra. So more than two and a half a year, the group people around the world recite the great compassion mantra and dedicate the merit to uh, to pandemic or everyone who is. Uh, challenged and had a difficult time in this kind of unstable times. So tomorrow, 6.30, it will be an uh, opportunity to join, I think, YouTube or uh, directly through Zoom. It's a Zoom link and, and also on our channel, Dharmaran Live uh, YouTube channel. All righty. That's great. I'm going to add one uh, to that list of events in Berkeley. We have an event here in the Gold Coast, um, virtual as well. So tomorrow is Monday the 31st here. It's Sunday in California. And from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Now, this is useful for folks who are listening from China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, New Zealand, other in, in this this hemisphere, this side, in the east, seven to eight p.m. It's unfortunately I think two a.m. in California. So hmm. anyway, there will be candle lighting and gong ringing from seven to eight p.m. This is seven to eight p.m. Australian Eastern time. So Sydney and Melbourne are different time zone already. So Taiwan is two hours behind. China is two hours behind. So you can calculate. Then, uh, starting Tuesday, New Year's Day, the Year of the Tiger, there will be three days of Medicine Buddha Repentance. Yao Shi Chan, Yao Shi Bao Chan. 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., 1.30 to 3.30, twice a day, and transference of merit. If you would like to take part, here's the info. You want these this Zoom address, can you see that? 
one two seven five nine eight nine four two um, is the is the password. And here's the. It's kind of tricky. Uh, I think if you go to gcdr. dot org. dot au, you can probably find this information. Gcdr Gold Coast Armor Realm. dot org. dot au. That's the address. So that's an event for New Year's here at the Gold Coast Dharma Room. It's virtual, it's online, but that doesn't mean it's any less sincere. And it's a chance for folks to cultivate together. All righty. I think that's it. Is that good for Berkeley and you all? That's, we're good? All right. Amitofo. Now, I'm going to uh, bring up our Medicine Buddha mantra. And something that, that I think we want to make the point over and over again is that the Bodhisattva on the first stage, it's called the stage of happiness, and he or she is happy because of the giving that they do. That's the place for the dana paramita to take place, the perfection of giving, the giving that takes you across to the other shore. So the more giving we do, the happier we get. That's really a true principle. And one of the ways that we can give during a time of a pandemic is to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra. Uh, it's called the Yao Shi Guan Ding Zhen Yan. And this mantra, has the energy, the vows, the cultivation of Medicine Buddha by Sajiraj Guru, his name is Yashifu, in it. And when we recite this mantra, it puts our hearts in a place of harmony, of balance, of yang, positivity. And we can, by sending that out to others, just thinking of giving, giving Dharma this way, it heals us and it heals the world to whatever degree of sincerity we can bring to it. So it's a real gift to the world, and it takes all the fear away, and all of the, the depression and the, the grief that can just be part of this incredible pandemic, this plague that's going through the whole world. So it's a proactive, positive thing to do, is to recite this mantra. Here it is in Sanskrit. Uh, you can learn it in Chinese if you like. Get the yellow book, or the Buddhist ceremonies book, Yao Shi Guan Ding Zhen Yan. But the Sanskrit has a real power to it. So we're going to transfer merit uh, with this mantra. Please send your mind in this direction. Here we go. And I also want to express my gratitude for all the volunteers that made this broadcast possible. Ara 
Tate some looks on the three times. Oh, I want to share my screen again so we can see the Buddhas here. We can bow to the Buddhas and create those blessings. Here we go. Bow to the Buddhas. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Okay, that's going to do it for us today. See you all next week. Omitofo. Bye-bye now.